Uh, Hebrews chapter 9 can be a little clunky. Uh, Some of it can be redundant. Uh, Some of it could be like, holy cow, what are we talking about? Okay, I'm just, to me anyways. And so hopefully we walk away from this chapter today with some gold in your pocket to be able to share with others. Gold in that not only do you have some value in your pocket and your relationship with Jesus, but gold so that you can redistribute it to others so that they can understand God's word too, right? It's a, it's a dual blessing this morning. We want to be disciples and we want to make disciples. That's our goal, right? So let's pray. Lord, thanks for this morning. Thank you for your word, Lord. It's a treasure to our heart. And Lord, it's a treasure that not only we can receive, but you can use us to redistribute. And so, Father, this morning, will you teach us? Lord, we, we want to know more about you about our relationship with you, and, and how we can share with others that they can have it too. So wherever anyone is at in this room, wherever anyone is at listening spiritually, wherever we're at in our walk with you, maybe we don't know you, maybe we don't know to what degree we do know you. Father, I pray that our relationship with Jesus this morning would be cultivated. And you would be glorified in our life. And that this moment would carry on for eternity. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, Hebrews chapter 9. Broken vessels, healing God. Broken vessels, healing God. Let's start out with the first five verses. Then indeed, even the first covenant had ordinances of divine service. And the earthly sanctuary. For a tabernacle was prepared, the first part, and which was the lampstand, the table, the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. And behind the second veil, the part of the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer and the ark of the covenant overlaid on all sides with gold, in which were the golden pot that had the manna, Aaron's rod that budded, And the tablets of the covenant. And above it, so above the ark, above it were the cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat. Of these things we can not now speak in detail. All right, so let's talk about it. So what the heck is the point of this that we're reading about? This earthly thing, this tent. That's what the tabernacle was during that season. It was a tent surrounded by a wall of sheepskin with a door on the front. And you could walk into a fenced in area and there was a tent in the middle. But before he got inside the tent, there was a place, an altar to to have sacrifices. There was a big bowl for people to wash their hands. And then there was the tent. And inside the tent, there was a lamp stand. There was some showbread. We've read about that in other places of scripture. And then there was a little veil, like another layer to the tent. And you could go, not everybody, but inside that second part. So it was a two-roomed tent, right? It was a tent with two rooms. You got the first part, and then the second part was called the Holy of Holies. I believe we have a picture of it. I might have throw, thrown us a curveball in my order here, but that's okay. So maybe or maybe not. Here's the image of the tabernacle of meeting in the desert. So in the Holy of Holies was this Ark of the Covenant, right? It was a box, Think of a box that had poles on it so you could carry it. Let's keep it simple. And it was covered in gold. And on top of the box with the gold poles, inside that back room in the tent, okay, box overlaid with gold, poles so you could carry this box, right? On top of the box were two golden angels facing each other with their wings pointed toward each other. A a, a golden angel on top of the box on one side and golden angel on top facing each other with their wings pointed on top of each other, okay, uh, toward each other, excuse me. The box had a door on it. Inside the box were three things. The tablets that God had given Moses the Ten Commandments on, likely the second one because we know what happened with the first one. Got a little feisty and broke it, right, unfortunately. Uh, Also, the staff of Aaron that budded, right? That's how we knew that Aaron was called to be the high priest and set apart from among men. That's how we know That's a different rabbit trail. So the staff, uh, it was a piece of wood, right? Like a shepherd carries in the wilderness. It was a piece of wood, right? But this one bloomed, all right? It it budded. So they knew that Aaron was set apart. And then um, what was the third thing in there? 
What'd you say? The manna, right? My daughter's name, Mana, by the way. It's not her name only has one N in it. But anyways, Mana, two Ns. I don't know why I mentioned that. Um, some people think her name is Mana. No, it's Mana. There's another story behind my daughter's name. Anyways, so let's keep this simple. First five verses. It was the tabernacle of meeting, a place on earth where we could go into the presence of God. Okay? Exodus 25, 8 through 9. And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them according to all that I show you, that is, the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all its furnishings, just so you shall make it. So God says, look, I want a relationship with people. People, hopefully you want a relationship with me, God said. Okay, for us to have a relationship, there has to be some sacrifices because y'all can't come in my presence, right? We've talked about this. God says, I'm holy. He says, you're not, all right? So he instituted this tabernacle of meeting. Listen to what it's called. Place of meeting. So the people could meet with God. And he says, look, there's a process if you want to be in my presence and you want my presence to be among you. There has to be a sacrifice to deal with the sin in your life. In other words, the things that y'all have done that are wrong, that are not perfect like me, something has to be, has to cover that so you won't die in my presence. So they instituted the sacrificial system where they kill goats and rams and later on there was um, some more intricacies to it. But the bottom line is an animal had to be killed as a sacrifice to cover our sin. That's what the whole Old Testament's about. If your friends ask you, what the heck is all that stuff about in the Bible before Jesus, all right? Keep it simple. Man wanted to be with God. God wanted to be with man. But something had to die to cover the people so they could be in the presence of a holy God. And that's what God put in place so they could meet with him. That's the first five verses. You know, sometimes I'm at work and... Uh, I hear people using crazy language, right? We've all used crazy language. Don't act like we don't use crazy language every once in a while, right? Stuff that you could say, oh, that's a curse or cuss word, right? Curse, cussing. Um, maybe you've told a joke. I don't know about you, but I have told a joke that's a little sketchy, right? Maybe I shouldn't be saying that, right? So at work, right, I wasn't talking about me this time. I was judging others. No. Um, I, I like when I tell a joke and people are like, um, all right. So I come into an environment at work where people are cursing or telling bad jokes and they stop. They're like, oh, 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 sorry, sorry. Everybody in this room recognizes that there is a different behavior that we should have if we're going to be in the presence of God. It's put inside of you from birth. Now, we, we uh, taint that. We church that up. We manipulate that. We change that. Maybe because if you were born here, maybe your parents taught you that was one thing. Maybe if you're born there in a different part of the world, you think it's a different thing and how you should behave in the presence of a holy God. But if you remove all that, everybody in this room still knows because God put in you a conscience with knowledge. That's what conscience means. Con with science, knowledge. God put in you a conscience that has knowledge from your birth that you should act a certain way in the presence of God. And we all know we don't. So this tabernacle is God saying, hey, let's put this in place so you can hang out with me and I can hang out with you. Verse 6. Now, when these things had been thus prepared... Now that it's all set up, we got the tabernacle set up, right? You know, when they build a ship, they break the wine glass on the side, they serenade it. All right, so that's where we're at. Now the tabernacle's set up. Verse 6, now when these things had thus been prepared, the priest always went into the first part of the tabernacle, that first room of that tent, performing the services. But into the second part of the, the high priest went alone once a year, not without blood. So he had blood with him, which he offered for himself and for the people's sins committed in ignorance. The Holy Spirit indicating this, 
that the way into the holiest of all, like the most, uh, the most, the closest, the most set apart, uh, the, 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 the least distance between man and God, is how we describe that tent, this most sacred place to be in the presence of God, that's, that's where we're at now. The Holy Spirit indicating this, that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was still standing. It was symbolic for the present time in which both gifts and sacrifices are offered, which cannot make him who performed the service perfect in regard to his conscience. Concerned only with foods and drinks and various washings and fleshly ordinances imposed until the time of the Reformation. All right, let's talk about 6 through 10. All right. 1 through 5, God says, here's a way if you want to hang out with me, here's how to do it. Verse 6 to 10, they were doing what God said and they figured out quickly that it covers all these outward things that we do, but it doesn't fix our conscience. It doesn't change our heart that it's still sinning. In other words, I can leave here today and try not to speed on the way home. Probably won't happen. I'm sorry, yes, youth, I will drive the speed limit all the way home. I could probably try and not yell at anybody today or hit anybody today or say a bad joke. I can go to work this week and, and maybe not tell any bad jokes. Maybe I never uh, say anything inappropriate about my boss. Outwardly, I can do all that stuff this week, but I guarantee you inwardly, I'm still messed up. I still think crazy stuff. I still want to yell at my boss. I still want to uh, be angry about somebody driving too slow or whatever it is. It's your business. But on, we can do all this outward stuff and we can do these rituals to justify our outward self. But in the center of who we are, we're still a sinner. We still miss the mark of perfection, right? That's what sin is. It's an archery term, right? We know that. Target, sin is missing the mark. Leviticus 16, 12 through 13. Then he shall make a, take a censer full of burning coals of fire from the altar before the Lord. With his hands full of sweet incense, beaten fine and bring it inside the veil. And he shall put the incense on the fire before the Lord that the cloud of incense may cover the mercy seat that is on the testimony lest he die. What was the point of all this? Let me ask you this. Why are you here? You don't have to answer out loud. Why are you here today? That's a bold question. I'm saying it with a stern face intentionally. I'm not judging you. I'm not judging your motive this morning of why you're here. I'm not assuming why, that I know why you're here this morning. But I asked myself that question this morning. Why am I here? What's the point? Like really, why do I keep... Why are you here? You ever um, see these things online? These concerts now are massive. It's Taylor Swift concerts. You seen these? I know you've seen them. So I know the young people have seen them. These Taylor Swift concerts are huge. You're in these huge stadiums. It's huge stadium after huge stadium after huge stadium. It's not a gymnasium. I mean, we're like. 80, 90,000 people deep, and everybody's dancing, everybody's dressed the same, it's great. Um, sorry. But uh, why, why would you go to that concert? Why would everybody gather? Yeah. Commonality. They want to have a good time with other people who like Taylor Swift. They want to celebrate that music. I'm not necessarily, I'm not judging like something in the music. That's not what I'm talking about. They're coming out. They like that music. They like that singer, right? But can't you go in a field and sing her song? Can't you take your technology that we have today, your phone, and just go on top of a mountain and listen to Taylor Swift? You could. But so then why do they all come together? Because it's better. It's better when you hang out with other people who like the same thing you do. It's unifying. It's, it's more powerful. 
Listen, I, I can... No, I can't. I can't dance on top of a mountain. <laughs> Sorry. My wife's like... Um, She's too much. Okay, my, I'm sorry. My point is this. I could. I can go up on a top of a mountain and worship the Lord. And I do. Sometimes with music, sometimes without. Sometimes I'll dance. Sometimes I'm on my knees crying. Sometimes I'm reading the Bible. I'm up there and I can do that. But there is also nothing like this. God put in us, just like he put knowledge in you, conscience with knowledge, he put that in you. He also put in you an awareness to know to come together as a group of followers of Jesus and worship him. He put that in you. And so that's why we do it. That's why I'm here. I'm here. Let me tell you something. This morning, the simple, the most trivial of hiccups to try and rattle my cage so I don't come to church this morning. I mean, things that are like this big that to me are like mountains to, to get me to not come to church this morning. Like to be mad at everybody already before I even walk in the door. Like silly stuff, like where a pair of socks they're at. You know what I mean? Like, hey, I need this certain pair of socks or um, cheesy stuff. And then I get here. And maybe this isn't for you. Maybe this doesn't apply. This is, I promise, for years, so special to the center of my life and my relationship with God. I'm just different. It's just, it's freeing. I, get, I, he, I heal here. I'm, I'm, I'm provoked to love and good works here. Uh, um, pr prophecy spoken in my life. I'm able to speak prophecy and use the gifts that God has given me to be a blessing to other people. I, I'm fulfilled. Not because of the me coming in here, reading the Bible, listening to the Bible. Not, no, not, re not in religious works. It's because there's a personal, intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. And when I come here, I have it, and y'all have it, and together we celebrate him, and he does something. And if you're coming here and you're not getting that, ask him why. Like, get to know Jesus here. Not just come to church because check a box because you're supposed to. That's not why you're here and that's not why I'm here. It's because there's something dynamic about giving. Listen, if Taylor Swift, how much more God should get our glory? So he is glorified. Galatians 3, 19 through 25. New Living Translation. Why then was the law given? It was given alongside the promise to show people their sins. But the law was designed to last only until the coming of the child who was promised. God gave his law through angels to Moses, who was the mediator between God and the people. Now a mediator is helpful if more than one party must reach an agreement. But God, who is one, did not use a mediator when he gave his promise to Abraham. Follow with me. Is there a conflict then between God's law and God's promises? Absolutely not. If the law could give us new life, we could be made right with God by obeying it. But the scriptures declare that we are all prisoners of sin. In other words, we can do all this stuff in the law. We can do everything in the Old Testament that God told, told them to do. We can have that tabernacle. We can kill those goats. We can go in there. We can send the high priest in there once a year. And we're still sinners. He has to go back in the next year and do it again. And guess what? We're still sinners. Keep reading in Galatians. Verse 22. But the scriptures declare that we are all prisoners of sin. So we receive God's promise of freedom only by believing in Jesus Christ. Before the way of faith in Christ was available to us, we were placed under guard by the law. We were kept in protective custody, so to speak. So good. Until the way of faith was revealed. Let me put it another way. The law was our guardian until Christ came. It protected us until we could be made right with God through faith. And now that the way of faith has come, we no longer need the law as our guardian. We read this, Hebrews 7, 18 through 19. 
For on the one hand, there is an annulling of the former commandment because of its weakness and unprofitableness. For the law made nothing perfect. On the other hand, there is the bringing in of a better hope through which we draw near to God. Let's do this. Let's think of other religions. Maybe you know details like, why shouldn't I be a Buddhist? Why shouldn't you be a Buddhist? Why shouldn't you, um, you know, be New Age? Why shouldn't you, why, should, why shouldn't you um, be uh, Muslim? Why? Think about it. How does a Muslim secure an eternal relationship with God? They're never sure. There's always, they, they, you can do everything in the Quran and still yet there's left, have I done everything I'm supposed to? You can uh, try and achieve as much Zen through the Buddhist system as you want and you're still not at peace. You can, um, you can go to the Catholic church, join, join the Catholic church, right, where there's a priest and you can go confess all your sins to the priest and guess what? You sin again. And the, the, this is literally the thing. This is what purgatory is. Think about this. The Catholic faith says this. The Catholic faith says you have to go and confess your sin to the priest. You're forgiven of your sin if you confess it to the priest. If you leave and you sin again and you die before going and confessing your sin again, it's not assured that you'll go to heaven. Who can live at peace like that? But Jesus says, I've showed you that doing all those outward religious things still doesn't fix it. So I got a fix for you. His name is Jesus. Watch this. 11 through 15. But Christ came as high priest of the good things to come. With the greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands. That is not of this creation. Not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood, listen to this, if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit, Offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And for this reason, he is the mediator of a new covenant by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant, that those who are called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. Christ, we know, and you know, and if you don't, here it is. Christ is the perfect sacrifice once and for all for our conscience. The, the, the blood of goats and rams covered our external failings. The death of Jesus Christ, if we believe, can cleanse our conscience. Where no one can see in your heart. Where you still sin, but no one might be knowing that you're, they don't know that you're sinning. But God sees it. And God says, I can deal with that. I can cover that, but only through the blood of Jesus Christ. Killing goats won't do it. Colossians 2, 16 through 23. Again, in the New Living Translation. These notes are often online afterwards, okay? The New Living Tra Translation sometimes just because it rounds off the edges, all right? Colossians 2, 16 through 23. So don't let anyone condemn you for what you eat or drink. For not celebrating certain holy days or new moon ceremonies or Sabbaths. In other words, if you forget to, to celebrate the Passover or something else. For these rules are only shadows of the reality yet to come. And Christ himself is that reality. Don't let anyone condemn you by insisting on... Listen to this, young ones. Listen to this, everybody in the room. Don't let anyone condemn you by insisting on pious self-denial... Or the worship of angels, saying they've had visions about these things. Their sinful minds have made them proud, and they are not connected to Christ, the head of the body. 
For he holds the whole body together with its joints and ligaments, and it grows as God nourishes it. Think about it like this. We are a body. If you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you're a body. There's an arm in here. There's a hand. Much more beautiful than that. It's just a practical example, right? And God says we grow when Christ nourishes us and we keep following him. All right, keep reading. For he holds the whole body together with his joints and ligaments, and it grows as God nourishes it. You have died with Christ, and he has set you free from the spiritual powers of this world. So why do you keep on following the rules of the world? Such as don't handle, don't taste, don't touch, don't look at that, don't say that, don't do that. Oh, you better not do that. It's not about that. It's about in here following Jesus. Let's keep reading. Verse 22. Such rules are mere human teachings about things that deteriorate as we use them. These rules may seem wise because they require strong devotion, pious self-denial, and severe bodily discipline. But they provide no help in conquering a person's evil desires. Listen, you can try and not look at something you're not supposed to. You can try and not say something that you're not supposed to. You can try and not, um, you know, lash out at somebody all week long. But we still have evil desires. And only Jesus Christ can minister to, heal, and deal with those evil desires in the depths of your heart. You can try and muster up enough strength and, and not do bad stuff this week. But you can't muster up enough strength and deal with the sin in your heart. Except for the power of Jesus Christ set you free. It's a spiritual thing that we are born into when Adam sinned. Romans 5.12, just as through one man sin entered the world and death through sin, thus death spread to all men because all sinned. So we're stuck in this sin world, this, this, this life of sin. Verse 14, look at that. I'll keep moving. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit, of, spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Listen to these few verses right here. 1 John 5, 10 through, 5 through 10. 1 John 1, 5 through 10. This is the message we heard from Jesus. Now I'm declared to you. God is light. And there is no darkness in him at all. So we are lying if we say we have fellowship with God, but go on living in spiritual darkness. We're practicing, we're not practicing the truth. But if we are living in the light as God is in the light, then we have fellowship with each other and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we claim we have no sin, we're only fooling ourselves and not living in the truth. But if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all wickedness. If we claim we have not sinned, we are calling God a liar and showing that his word has no place in our hearts. Okay, let's back up. So if you put your trust in Jesus and if in the depth of your heart God has cleansed you from all iniquity, you've put your trust in Jesus, now you've dealt with the conscience your soul's been dealt with, all right? It's covered by the blood. God, Paul, the whole Bible, Jesus says, that doesn't mean now that you can just go on sinning. He says, now walk in the light. Have fellowship with me and walk in the light. What, what's it said? Um, Hebrews talks about, we read about crucifying Christ again when we continue to walk in things that we shouldn't. Um, you know, grandmas often say, what is it? Be careful little eyes what you see. Be careful little mouths what you say. Be careful little ears what you hear. Is that some, to some degree how it goes? And so when God heals our heart, we don't want to just go on living in sin. Now we want to walk in that light. And when people see our lives, they're going to see what? Jesus. And they're going to perhaps want it too. A personal relationship with him. So how are you at peace right now? Or how, are, I, I keep thinking about addiction. I don't know why I keep thinking about, I don't know, maybe we're wrestling with addiction this morning or something. But it could be to your phone. Like, oh, that's not what, we, we weren't thinking that addiction. Okay, put your phone down the rest of the day, everybody in the room. Just today, till you go to work tomorrow. I, I know moms are like, I got to stay in touch with my Kids, okay, I don't know how to deal with all that. But um, for real, other than that, like turn the, turn the ringer on on your phone perhaps the rest of the day. So you don't have to be right beside it. 
and set it on by the coffee pot when you get home and see if you have an addiction or not. I don't know if it would be to the coffee or to the phone, but anyways. And, and so the world sees when we suffer trial and tribulation on the earth, like something bad happens to you, they see it. And when your response isn't to turn it up or to take another puff or to go do something crazy, when your response is, Jesus has got this, I don't know what he's doing, but I'm going to wait this thing out, they see it. And perhaps then they'll know that puff I took, that drink I swished, and that thing I did didn't comfort me. But I see that you got the real comfort. And we can talk about this all we want to and sound fancy about it. And we're at another church meeting, and here we are saying it. But when this plays out in your life, when somebody dies in your family who you love and you keep putting your trust in God, and you're okay... They're like, this must be real. Look, number one, it'll be real to you because his peace will surpass understanding if you believe. Look, you, you, can, you can have this and not apply it. Great example. We have this. That doesn't mean we're reading it. You can have peace that surpasses understanding in the most hell of moments and not embrace it. And you could say, well, you, and, and we justify it by our practical intellectual capability. No, it's stop rationalizing why we shouldn't have trust in God. I make some crazy decisions sometimes. <laughs> With counsel, with accountability, with the word of God. But sometimes I, I just do. I just make these crazy decisions. And I, we've said a lot. Between the giving of the promise and the fulfilling of promise, there's often a gap. Mr. Covey calls it proactivity. The first of the seven habits to highly successful people. I call it faith. It's, it's the waiting on God to complete what he said he's going to do in your life. And not freaking out in the time gap between. Just trust them. And everybody around you is going to say, well, you got to do this and you got to do that and you got to do this. If God says, don't do that and don't do this and just be quiet and wait, that's where the blessing is. I don't know what the heck that was about. Praise the Lord. Listen, check this out. The old covenant was based on man's faithfulness to God. The old covenant, the tabernacle. To be covered from your sin, you had to take the goat to the, to the tabernacle. The priest had to kill it, and he had to carry the blood in on your behalf. That had to happen. What was it dependent on? Y'all had to bring a goat. What happens if your alarm clock didn't go off and you didn't bring the goat? You're not covered. It was dependent on you doing something to make sure you got forgiven. Read it again. The old covenant was based on man's faithfulness to God. The new covenant is based on God's faithfulness to you. He's like, look, you ain't got to do a thing except receive it. If we would just know that. The first covenant failed because man was not faithful. We didn't show up to bring the sacrifice. The first covenant failed. We were stuck in sin because we didn't do our part. We're sinners in the first place. How in the heck did we think we were going to get something right? Anyways, sorry. I'm not speaking disrespectfully to anyone in here. I'm just emphasizing this because it's real. The new covenant, listen to this, everybody. The new covenant fails not because God is faithful. God's alarm, he doesn't miss the alarm clock. So listen, if God sets his alarm to do something, he never misses it. If God says he's going to be there, if God said he's going to take care of you, if God said he's going to provide for you, if God's going if he says, look, I'm going to show you a way through this. 
He's not a liar. How big of an adventure are you willing to go on with God? I mean, like, how rad are you willing to get for the kingdom? I'm backing down, sorry. Like, what, what, what will, we, let's rephrase it. To what degree do we limit the promises of God being fulfilled in our life? Not because he's not willing. John 1, 17. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. When you start, listen, when we start taking steps of faith, youngins, look, I'm going to tell you the truth. I was praying, for, we were praying for y'all this morning. Yeah, you, my daughter's like about passed out. I see you. She's, she's like, Dad, I have to listen to you all the time. Um, sorry, shouldn't do that. I apologize. What was I saying? You go up on a mountaintop. Okay, you have this moment with God. Every adult in here knows what I'm talking about. You go to church, mountaintop with God. Guess what happens the next day? Real life. And will we cling to his promises then? It's easy on the mountaintop. Weather's just perfect. My hair looks good. Hold on, one more thing. One more thing to this. One more thing. Young ones and everybody in this room. Okay, you ready? What's really hard? We're talking about that time gap. Okay, I'm putting my trust in Jesus. I don't see nothing happening. Okay, I, that's, that's me. Um, it, it, it's in that time gap. Not only is there a gap of time between you trusting what God has said to you and God bringing it about. Okay, there's a time gap, all right, where it's an opportunity for you to express your devotion. It's like, I still love you. And we even fall short in that and he'll cover us. But the point is this. Often, a lot of hell is going to come at you to get you to not believe. A lot of, and it looked like a guy in a suit with well intentions. And, and, and just chirp, 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 chirp. You're not going to believe. You're not going to do that. It can be, I don't know what it is for you because it's dynamic. We don't live, we don't wrestle against what? Flesh and blood. So it's not like I can sit here and describe this thing or articulate it with that perfectness. So, oh man, this is what DA was talking about. Guy with a suit on has Santa Claus on his tie. Um, no, in, I'm telling you, through experience. Listen, um, what does James say? Mm, this is good stuff, dude. You're, well, anyways, um, Hebrews James. I always think about that making coffee, like James got made the coffee, Hebrews James. Anyways, uh, 1, 12. That's a horrible translation. Hold on one more second. This is good. I, uh, yesterday... Let's do one, two. James, one, two. James, one, two, and 12. All right? This is anybody. We're talking about when you put your trust in Jesus and you're waiting on Jesus to come through, that middle ground of real life. Oh, yeah, I worship Jesus. I receive his promises. Woohoo! And then next week, you're like, <clears throat> I was, remember Sunday, Lord, right? What's going on? You're not coming through right now. We're talking about this gap of time, right? And James, one, two says, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work. Let patience, let, let that waiting do everything that Christ wants it to do in the depth of your heart. Let God bring about all that, that, that. Let him make everything in the kitchen he was wanting to make. Don't rush him. Don't, don't just get the, the, the main course. Get the appetizer, the main course, and the dessert while you're waiting on God. Let them just keep on cooking. Watch this. I know that's crazy. Sorry. But, um, but let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. If I, I've done it a thousand times. If I keep bailing out on the promise in that waiting period then I didn't receive everything that Christ wanted me to receive in spiritual maturity. So when this battle comes swirling back around, 
I'm probably still going to have some sea legs because I didn't withstand it the last time. I need a big mirror right here, okay, so I can just be preaching at myself, you know. Um, Verse 12, blessed is a man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised. I went, I went, on, a, I went on a little deal hike in the woods yesterday. Um, so good. And uh, I was wrestling with God, you know. I, I, not too much, because I know what happened to Jacob. But I was wrestling with God. And <laughs> there's a, I'm sorry. So silly. I was, I was talking to God politely yesterday about some challenge I was having. And I didn't get the result. And I come out of the woods, right? I'm out of breath from running. And uh, I get in my car and I'm like, well, I went on the run to get the answer and I didn't get the answer. And there's a truck parked in front of me and the license plate says James 1, 2 on it. Yeah, isn't that cool? Yeah. It's, it's just so good. I'm looking at this truck. I'm like, are you serious? You know, and I see the little fish on there. I'm like, okay, dude. And then it says born again on there. And I'm like, yeah, but that's me. I got you. James, James one, two. I don't know. Verse 16. Back to Hebrews. For there is a testament, for where there is a testament, there must also of necessity be the death of the tester. For a testament is enforced after men are dead, since it has no power at all while the tester lives. Therefore, not even the first covenant was dedicated without blood. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and goats with water, scarlet, wool, and hyssop, and sprinkle both the book itself and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the covenant which God has commanded you. Then likewise, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessel of the ministry. And according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. Here's the point. Testament means will. You know, I, I just literally means, this means me writing a letter. And it says, when I die, this is going to happen. If somebody will receive my junk. (laughs) Yeah, here's all my stuff. I'm sorry. But it, it doesn't have any power until I die. The Old Testament, the laws, we, they weren't covered until they came to the tabernacle and killed the goat. When the goat died, the will was executed. They were covered. But we didn't execute our part of the will by killing the goat, so we weren't covered all the time. In the same way when Jesus came, he said, listen, I am what? It's on your shirt. Uh, it might not be. James 14, 6, sorry. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me, right? The, you got the seven I am's or eight I am's, however, however you want to count them. And Jesus says, you know, I am the bread of life. I am the door. I am the gate. Um, on and on, all right? Jesus said all that stuff. He wants to be all that for you. He died. His blood has been shed. Have you received the promise? For the will to be enacted, someone had to die. The will has been enacted. Now will you receive the stuff? Forgiveness of your sins. And a relationship with Jesus for all of eternity. Oh, a great way to remission. Look at this. Last Uh, verse 22 and without shedding of blood there is no remission without the shedding blood there's no remission a good way it's simple Uh, remission to send away or released from bondage there was no release from bondage without the shedding of blood okay verse 23 verse 23 therefore It was necessary that the copies of the things in heaven should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ has not entered the holy places made with hands. So he's like, the priest went into this holy place in a tent that some men made. Christ, where are we at? Verse uh, 24. 
For Christ has not entered the holy place that's made with hands, which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Not that he should offer himself often as a high priest enters the most holy place every year with the blood of another. That's good. Verse 26. Then he would have had to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now, once at the end of the ages, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And it, as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. A few things here as we start to wrap up. Um, I was working in the yard a couple days ago, right? Working in the yard. And uh, I'm, I, man, I, I have headbud, earbuds in all the time. At work, like if I have to do something at my desk for 10 minutes, I put my earbuds in, right? Could be a worship song, could be a podcast I like, could be a teaching, whatever. I, I, uh, on the, if I go exercise, what do I do? Put earbuds in. Um, if I'm in the yard working, what do I do? Put earbuds in. Um, if I'm studying, a lot of the time, what do I have in? Music. Something going, Right? constantly noise 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 oh man i'm listening to some great teachings uh, i went somewhere the other day man i put the audio bible on i was listening to the word of god i'm so spiritual you know and yesterday i was going to, to do some stuff in the yard and it was like hey hey there's no earbuds don't listen to anything while you're out in the yard working listen to the chainsaw <laughs> you know listen to whatever else listen to the birds listen. so i go out there with nothing and the Lord's like, finally, are you ready to listen to me? I've been listening to teachings. I've been listening to the Bible. I've been listening to worship every single day, every minute. Yeah, other stuff too. I'm not acting like, oh, no, but I'm just saying, you know, a lot of biblical content going in. And God's like, no, no, it's a personal, I'm alive. Let's talk for a minute like normal people have a conversation. And he began to pour in. We couldn't go there before Jesus died. I'm going to ask the musicians to come up. We're going to sing the song again. The throne room. Jesus went in the throne room once and for all so we can go in any time. And it's not just when we get there, family. You want to be rejuvenated? You want to be revived? You want to get some answers? Go to the throne room. If you've received Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins, guess what? The door's open wide. Come on in. I mean, when you're at work and you're having the most worst of moments, and everybody's chirp, 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 chirp. You're believing. You have faith now. Yeah, 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 yeah. You're at school. What's the point of that? You went to where? You know, yak, 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 yak. And all that yak, 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 you can be in the middle of the throne room. Right then, right there. They run their mouth all they want. And you could be doing something physical, working. You could have a chainsaw. You could be, who knows what you do. I don't know what you do. I'm just giving personal examples. And right there in the midst of that deepest battle, I can be in the throne room like, God, I don't know. I haven't trusted you a lot, Father. But I want to trust you right now. And watch. Maybe, maybe that project that you're working on or maybe that family situation that you're dealing with. <laughs> maybe that sickness. Maybe that, that oppression. Maybe, maybe those dominoes and those puzzle pieces don't come together right then. But in the depth of your heart you will be comforted and you will be at peace if you enter that throne room. It all still might be going on. He might not have said, all right, here's your free pass. Everything's fixed now. You, you, you walked in the room one way, you walk out, everything looks like you're in heaven all of a sudden. No, fam, we're not there yet. Last verse. 
Last verse. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many to those, listen to this, to those who eagerly wait for him. He will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. My son was going over um, my mom's house uh, this weekend. And uh, he was like, yo, what time's, what time's Ita coming? What time's grandma coming, you know? And I'm like, uh, she'll be here at noonish. He's like, what time is it? You know, I'm like, dude, we got to learn how to tell time. We're working on telling time. It's 11. We still got an hour at least. Noon comes. Where's she at? Uh, it's going to be a little bit longer. Okay, a little bit longer. A little bit longer happens. Another hour. Where's she at? He was eagerly expectant and waiting for his grandmother to come to go hang out with her. These trials and tribulations can do one of two things. It can cause your faith to be fragile and you fear and run. Or it can cause you only to eagerly await the coming king more. Recognizing, you know what? Yeah, it's jacked up out here right now. It's a broken world with sin in it. But I know my Redeemer's coming. I don't know when he's going to be here, but man, it's going to be soon. And not soon enough for me. I'm ready. Listen, listen to these promises. Listen to these promises at the end. Look at these. Listen to these promises. This is, these are promises. Listen to these promises. These are promises. We talk about us not showing up to kill the goat. Remember? Here's God and what he says he'll do for us. Salvation. Romans 1, 16 through 17. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. For the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. Listen to this. Everything will work out for our good if we receive it. If we have faith. Romans, you know the verse? You, we know these verses. Romans eight twenty eight. For we know that all things work together for good to those who love God. To those who are called according to his purpose. We will have comfort in our trials. 2 Corinthians 1, 3 through 4. Blessed be God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Father of mercies and God of all comfort. It didn't say the pain will stop or the trial will go away. It says we'll have comfort in the midst of it. Who comforts us in all our tribulation. That we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort which we ourselves are comforted by God. Guys, our trials have a dual purpose. Number one, they grow us and then they uh, equip us to comfort others so that they can have faith in Jesus too. And people get to go to heaven because of our trials. So I, sometimes I'm like, get me out of this trial. And God's like, you keep praying for me to use you to reach people for me. And this is the way I'm doing it. So which do you want? All right, anyways, new life and new living. Second Corinthians 5 says, listen, we can have a new life. Who the heck has been through junk and wants to be set free from the junk and walk in a new life? Everybody. Listen, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new crea creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. You can walk in here one way and walk out another way. And every time you come to the throne room, you can come to the throne room one way and you can leave a different way. Same door, but changed person. He will finish what he starts in us. Philippians 1.6, being confident. Are we confident? Are we co am I confident that God's going to do what he said he's going to do? In my, in my marriage, in my family, with my job, in my community, with the fellowship. Am I confident? Being confident of this very thing that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Anyways, peace when we pray. You can have peace. Philippians 4, 6 through 7. Be anxious for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Jesus Christ. And one more. There's how many? Thousands in the Bible? Here's another one. He will supply our needs. We, 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 how, how often have you been let down by someone saying they're going to help you out? And sometimes they do, and then you go the next time and say, I need a little bit more help, and they're not able to help you. And I'm not saying that's 
bad on them. That just could be part of what the Lord's doing because he wants to supply our needs. Matthew 6, 31 through 33. Therefore, do not worry, saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. Seek first the kingdom of God. Seek first him. <laughs> Where am I going to work, God? Who's going to give me a job, God? Where am I going to live? What, should I go to school? Should I not go to school? Should I buy that car? Should I not buy that car? Should I eat that hot dog? Should I not eat that hot dog? God, I don't know if I got enough money for this. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Seek Jesus. And these other things shall be added to you. That's the gospel. It's Jesus. It's worth living for. So, Lord, thank you. You're worth living for. You thought we were worth dying for. Thank you for dying for us. And Lord, we're still here. We're still battling. We still don't get it right a lot. We still get apprehensive. We still doubt. Lord, I pray today you would heal us. I pray that today you would forgive us. You took our punishment. You rose from the dead. So we can be forgiven and we could have new life. And you're going to come back and get us. And you know when the time is right. You're, you're not like grandma who may or may not be late or may or may not know what the best time to come is. Father, you're God. And you know just when it's time to come get us. And it's not time yet. It may be tomorrow. It may be in five minutes. And that would be super rad, God. But if you choose to wait a little longer, I pray that our appetite would only increase eagerly awaiting for you. Lord, because it's not normal. We'd rather pursue things that are gratifying momentarily. Lord, so we're asking that you would do this work in us. Jesus, help us to, to grow and eagerly waiting for and falling in love with you. And we know that as we seek your kingdom and we seek your righteousness, <laughs> the house, the job, the pain, you'll take all that. You'll keep us at peace in the midst of it. So this morning, Father, we want to want to give thanks. So this morning, they're going to sing. And if, uh, if you need some prayer, I would encourage you to come. If you need to come sit down, come stand here. If you want somebody to pray. Do you know how many times I've, listen, this is up to you. You don't have to come. You can do this in a home fellowship group. You can do this after church. You can do this on your knees at home. But I'm going to tell you something. You know how many times I have come up front and if no one comes up here, that's fine. I'm not, but I'm just saying, I, want, I just want y'all to know that this is always open. This right here, this isn't, it's just a wood floor. Nothing, there's not light, a lightning bolt's not going to strike anybody. Okay, I hope. Nothing like that's going to happen. Here's the point. Do you know how many times I've, I've responded? 
I've got up and said, God, I don't know why you're tugging me to go for it, but I'm going to go. And I've gotten here and somebody's prayed over me prophetically. They've spoken in my life questions they had no clue I was asking. Or I needed, that they say something I hadn't even thought about through the power of the Holy Spirit that I needed to hear. So, or maybe you just need to come up here and say, God, you know what? I'm broken. I've run off and I'm just, I'm coming back home. Whatever it is, if God is ministering to you, please don't be embarrassed if you need to come up here and, and get prayed over. Okay. But, uh, and if not, not, but let's consider, let's consider what Jesus is saying this morning as they say. Dream after dream, you are speaking to me, breathing word after word of kingdom come. Here at your feet, I can see the unseen, truly one look at you and I'm undone. I run to the throne room. Come run to the throne room And I fall on my face With angels and saints And all I can say is Holy, holy, holy Are you God? My heart can't contain The weight of your name And all I can say is Holy, holy, holy Are you Grace upon grace, so my fears fall away. Only your perfect love for me remains. Time after time, you stay close by my side, burning fire inside I can't contain. I run to the throne room. I run to the throne room and I fall on my face with angels and saints and all I can say is holy, holy, holy are you God. My heart can't contain the weight of your name and all I can say is holy, holy, holy are you. Yes, we fall.
please don't let me fool anybody in this room. I'm a broken man. And I don't leave here and, and, and do everything right at all. And sometimes I intentionally do what's wrong. More, more than I ever want to. But I believe in Jesus. And I'm sharing with you. Everybody in this room can be forgiven. And if you want to receive that forgiveness and have new life, you don't have to do anything other than receive the present right now. It's got your name on it. It's already been purchased. Of anything you've ever done. It's interesting, the, the word uh, the, that the blood is cleanses, that Jesus cleanses from all unrighteousness, it, it, it's a... Uh, that, that word there is a constant. It's like from past cleanse, it's a current cleanse, and it's a constant cleansing for the future too. It's unlike any other blood. That's the blood of a perfect God. And so if you want it, maybe tell him just like this, perhaps, talking to him, dear Jesus, I need forgiveness. I've dishonored you. Thank you for taking my punishment on the cross. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for, for rising from the dead so I could have new life. Please forgive me of all my sin and fill me with your Holy Spirit as a seal that I'm yours for all of eternity. In Jesus' name. Lord, thank you for this morning. And, and we still see dimly. kind of as in a mirror, but one day we'll see you face to face. And all these battles, they will make a lot more sense. But until then, may we have faith in you. In Jesus' name. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May his countenance overshadow and surround you. May you have his grace. God's riches at Christ's expense for you. And then may you have his peace because of it. You are completely forgiven if you've asked for it. I mean... He didn't leave anything out. You are forgiven. Don't even think about it. Move on and walk in newness of life. May you have his peace. In the name of Jesus, we all say amen. Thanks for being here, family. What a Thank you for your patience. Love you. If you need prayers, a bunch of elders in here. Y'all have a blessed week in the word, uh, in the Lord. Love you.